Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369 0703 768 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. So good morning, brethren, and I bring you greetings. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak with you. And I really enjoyed the session we had before now. Um, I will be taking us through a couple of things like my sister just said about how we can improve the system that we work in. And please let me point out here that this is not just for any particular cadre of staff. This is for every one of us and the beautiful part of quality improvement is that we can apply it to every aspect of our lives, not just work, even spiritually, we can apply the principles and the methodologies of quality improvement. This morning, we would quickly go through a couple of things, and I hope that you'll be able to um, walk the journey with me. Um, I just want to say that there is nothing to disclose. Um, I do not have any affiliations with any uh, drug company or anything like that. So let's start. So let's quickly just imagine in our minds that we're taking a picnic by the riverside and suddenly we heard cries of a particular child that is drowning in that body of water. And we quickly rushed to go and save this child from drowning. As we make our way to the bank of the river, we heard another cry, another child is drowning. And so we go back in. After doing this for like five minutes, we saw one of us just stop and begin to walk towards the head of the river. And we were like, why are you leaving us to save these children? You're not joining us in this effort. And this person says to us, I'm going to the head of the river to find out who is throwing these children into the river. Because if we stop him or her, then we would not need to be trying to um, save children from drowning. Um, that kind of thinking that this fellow imaginarily yeah, has applied is what we call upstream thinking. And the lesson here is that very often when you've spent years and countless amount of time responding to problems, you can sometimes overlook the fact and the reality that you could of a necessity be preventing those problems. So this morning, um, at the end of this session, my prayer is that we'll be able to collectively define what quality in improvement in healthcare is, would be able to understand the components of the journey of quality. And finally, we'll be able to better understand or be aware of the 21st century opportunities to healthcare improvements. Let me start us off by giving us a few quotes. Dr. Tedros of the WHO recently said that quality is not a given. It takes vision, planning, investment, compassion, meticulous execution and rigorous monitoring from the national level to the smallest remotest clinic. What this means is it doesn't leave anyone out in my small corner, in your small corner, as a leader in your health institution, as a follower in your department, you have a role to play to ensure that the vision is executed because quality would not just happen. A few more quotes. Paul Batalden, who is a major um, in quality improvement, says that every system is perfectly designed to produce the results that it gets. The implication of this statement is that we would not just get the results that we see in our systems, every single outcome, every single output, every result, every trend that we observe in our system is as a result of the design that went into that system. And then Don Berwick, the founder of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement says that some is not a number soon, is not a time and hope 
is not a plan. I need to flag this that this is not biblical hope. It is hope as we use it in the context of English language. We hope that things will get better. We hope that things would improve. That is not a plan. It is difficult also to improve what you do not measure. So as we go along, you will hear me talk about measurement and a few other components of quality improvement. The Institute of Medicine, and I'm sure you've heard about them, but you would know about them before we're done, stated that between the healthcare that we have right now in any system in the world or in any system in Nigeria and the care that we could have between those two lies just not just a gap but a chasm it, the the gap is huge so you can't just call it a gap now the institute of medicine did some study um 1999 and came up with uh the quality of chasm report and in that report they identified what we call the dimensions of quality so when we say quality 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 what exactly does it mean we've done a good job to summarize this in an acronym called steep and the s stands for safe so if healthcare is of high quality, it must be safe. That means we must avoid injuries to patients from care that is intended to help them. So when people walk into your clinic or your hospital, they're not meant to be getting harmed. They're not meant to leave worse than they came in. You're not meant to take malaria from them and give, give them an hospital acquired infection. So quality healthcare must be safe. Again, it must be timely. What is the point in giving high, safe, and high quality care if it comes late what's the point of medicine after death so when people come into your hospital or your establishment or your organization regardless what you do it's important that you pay attention to the fact that you want to reduce the weights and sometimes harmful delays for patients and providers it's very key that we do whatever we want to do or we need to do keeping time and accessibility at the back of our minds. Of course, effectiveness. Um, this is about providing the appropriate level of services based on the current scientific knowledge or best practices that we have. We must address things. So things like, uh, do you give antimalarials without running tests? Do you just treat typhoid just because somebody has some symptoms that may even be COVID and things like that? So care must be effective for us to say it is quality efficient that means we need to avoid waste in every of its form uh, waste of equipment of ideas of energy of supplies i remember doing some work with some hospitals and when i asked them for any particular equipment it takes them like five to ten minutes to even like figure out where it is in their hospital and then be able to go fetch it and those are very crucial minutes quality care must be equitable that means we shouldn't use someone's um um, status in the society to decide the, the quality of care they get. It, we must provide care and that is um, equitable and that does not vary based on personal differences or characteristics. And um, finally, we we must make quality healthcare to be patient or person or people centered. This is um, an aspect where many of us as um, healthcare professionals struggle. The training, the background, the history of the work we do um, has made us to feel like we're supreme, we're sovereign. So every time we say, put the patient or the person in front of you at the center of your decision making, uh, we struggle with letting go of control. Like, okay, I'm the guru here, I'm the expert. I should be telling the patient what to do, but we need to learn that we need to co-produce the healthcare that we're given to the patient or that we're offering as services to the person in front of us. And that means we must put them at the center of every decision that we make, carry them along, make the decisions together. So I'll pause here and ask a question. So what exactly does quality care mean to you in your field, in your office? as you discharge your duties as the leader in your organization what does quality care mean to you and how does that definition that you have given quality translate into the policies that you make the protocols that you develop the processes that you endorse and the support that you give to the people who follow you all right so we all know a little bit about no the no do gap and basically what that means is most of us do less than we know to do all right so in the past when things were not this jet like in the approach where knowledge was slow in being generated the distance between what we knew and what we did wasn't so much so you have that as been yesterday 
um, today that gap has widened as um, knowledge gets generated and regenerated and outdated every couple of months. Uh, the future is that there will be so much knowledge, overload of information, that we would have a huge gap now a chasm between what we actually do and what we know to do. The danger here is that people would still be coming into our health institutions and would most likely still be dealing with them and offering services based on some outdated evidence. And that smells trouble for everyone involved. So how do we begin to bridge this gap? There are several different frameworks and models that we use in quality improvement. One of them is the Donabedia model, which basically says that outcomes are not random. Yeah, they are developed or they are gotten by the structures and processes that go into them. So in this picture you see in front of you, we're saying that the mortality, the morbidity, the cost of care, the quality of life or the quality of services, even the patient's experience, are not things that we can touch on without first looking at the structures and the processes that go into these things. Now, before you begin to point fingers at your, um, your governance and the management of your institutions, let's all first of all know that in quality improvement, we have a saying that there is no blame, no naming, no shaming. We accept 100% responsibilities for the results that we get. It doesn't mean that I'm saying that as a frontline worker, you are the governance of your institution. Institution, but I'm saying that at your level within your space, there's so much that you can do to influence the outcomes. Okay, so the physical facilities, equipment, technology, the education and training, um, remuneration, which all of us like to hear about, the human resources are all part of the structures that go into quality and the processes of care, how we make diagnoses, how we offer our treatments, the appropriateness of the care that we're given to the people we're giving them to, and the process of care are all processes that join together with the structures will lead to outcomes. The one that you don't find here in the modified Donabidian model is the culture. And that is one area that as Christians, we have a huge responsibility to influence in our spaces. The culture, what is the attitude of our minds as we begin to engage with our co-workers and the patients that we care for. I'll quickly run us through Joseph Duran's trilogy. My sister in our introduction mentioned uh, quality assurance and then we talked about quality control. And so basically quality assurance is very similar to quality control and the, um, with quality planning and quality improvement, they make the three pillars of what we call Duran Trilogy. I'll quickly just go over them and explain them to us. So where exactly does quality improvement stand in the journey of improvement? So you have quality assurance and control that speaks basically to the standards, the guidelines, the protocols, professional oversight, things like accreditation by regulatory bodies, performance review, regardless the um, the gratitude, the, gravi the gravity of it, um, things like audits that we conduct within our systems. These are all quality assurance methods or moves or efforts that we make. Again, we look at quality improvement or continuous quality improvement, CQI, to talk in a framework basically about three things. Do we set aims? What are the gaps in the performance that we have observed in quality assurance? And outcomes what are those gaps and from those we set the aims of why we want to bridge those gaps because i must quickly tell us that it doesn't take a genius to know that you shouldn't throw things on the floor in the hospital or that waste should be segregated that you shouldn't put infectious waste with papers and stuff like that no it doesn't take a genius to know when there are gaps it doesn't take a genius to know when you walk into an institution there should be some form of fire safety mechanism in place um but when you have noticed these gaps and the regulatory bodies, for an instance, has come into your system and they have told you these are the gaps that you have, then what? So the, the culture of continuous quality improvement is that method of framework that equips us, first of all, with the thinking and then with the skill sets, the knowledge, the tools that are required to move us in the right direction to fill the gaps that we need to fill. And measurement comes in very handy. And that's why you have measurements as the tool to measure and provide feedback, evaluate, facilitate the processes and the outcomes. And then the truth is, if we have been doing what we have been doing since forever, 
how are we going to get a different set of results? So changes are very, very important and necessary for us to make the changes to see the results that we want to see. So the improved outcomes will come from a merger. So don't say, no, we are not about um, changes. We just want accreditation. Accreditation shouldn't be an event. It should be a means to an end. So even if your system is accredited, the question I would ask is, do you have a culture of continuous quality improvement? Quality planning serves as the overall role framework or governance that provides direction so when we have learned things about improvement we build them into policies we make resources available we coordinate and create accountability systems and we drive execution within the system so that's the framework for quality planning quality control or quality assurance and quality improvement um, so i'm going to just breeze through this imagine in a system you are, have a performance of about 40 percent your system is stable in that area zone of control through number one and the quality planning provides policies and framework and support and governance to make this continue to run but as your system continues to run you notice that there is a deep there's some form of um, um, deep in your performance and things are not going the way you want them to go so quickly you pull together your quality improvement team and you have the first zone of improvement so you begin to do uh, things like PDCA or PDSAs plan do study act 5S all these methodologies Kaizen Lean Six Sigma what have you to improve back to where you were then you found out that you were able to make that happen and you went like okay so if we go if we're able to move back from 20 to 40 what if we can improve this? So you continue to improve and you have a zone of improvement too. And you, now you settle at a zone of control at 80%. So once you have done that, you feed back your learning into your quality planning, the policies, the support, the resource allocation, coordination and feedback and all of that. And as you do that, you begin to learn that you can stabilize your system and continue to improve as a way of life within your system. Let's quickly move on to the principles, the models and tools of um, quality improvement. Um, five basic things you need to know about improvement. First of all, you need to know why. Why are you improving? And as Christians, we are we have an understanding that we have been placed strategically by kingdom in the places where we work. So it's important for us to understand the why beyond the remuneration, beyond what government says, is the fact that we are kingdom and we're different. Then you need to get feedback to know if you are improving and that talks about measurement. Then you need to develop a change. I just said it. If you have been doing what you have been doing and getting a particular set of results, you don't get a different set of results by doing more of what you have been doing. There has to be something to change. It may be new it may be different but there has to be a change but not all change or changes lead to improvement so you need to test a change and find out is it improving if it's not improving embrace the failure embrace the learning move to the next possible change and once you're able to test a change and it works then you can implement that change across your system then build it into your policy this is the new way of doing things after you have proven that this works all these things I've said, those five things I said you need to know are captured in what we call the model for improvement, which talks about what three questions and the PDSA cycle, as you can see on the screen. The three questions are, what are we trying to accomplish, which is your aim? How would we know that a change is an improvement, which is your measurement? That's the only way you would know. If you're trying to lose weight and you're not weighing yourself on the scale, you, you would never know that the uh, diet modification or lifestyle changes you have made have led to improvement. The last question is, what change can we make that will result in improvement? And this question is based on the premise that not all change leads to improvement, though for improvement to happen, there must be change change so how would you know that this change leads to improvement you must test that change and that is where the pdsa cycle comes in so you generate with your team a change idea and then you test at a small level what you may call pilot or whatever it is but you test on a small scale with a few um, set of people workers and patients and when you generate the change or improvements that you desire then you can begin to scale test in other context and ultimately improve, uh, implement that change in your system. Two types of knowledge are needed for uh, system improvement. The subject matter knowledge and every one of us in this space has been trained in one profession or another. So that is what subject matter knowledge is, all right? The other one that we are not very familiar with is profound knowledge. And this is the interplay of theories of 
um, building your knowledge about your system, uh, understanding your system, understanding variation data that I just showed you, and the psychology of change. Now, for improvement to happen, these two types of knowledge must come together. Your ability to make improvements is enhanced when you combine subject matter expertise or knowledge with profound knowledge in creative ways. And brothers and sisters, Job 32.8 says, but there is a spirit in man and the breath of the almighty gives them understanding. So we, when we combine this subject matter knowledge with profound knowledge, we as believers add a dimension of spiritual insight that is not available for the average common man or the carnal man. So it's very key that we tap into this, this vast resources of wisdom as Christ has been made wisdom to us. All right. And it's important that as we leverage that, we begin to build on the resources that the spirit makes available for us. This picture just shows us what I just spoke about, about the four elements that comes into the profound knowledge. The one I want to emphasize briefly is the psychology of change because we have to deal with people and you see the psychology of change here and as we move forward the process for quality improvement the kingdom narrative just basically walks us through all the things we need to do to make improvement happen the first thing like god did in genesis 1 is to identify the problem so the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the deep so god identified a problem there was chaos and the first thing God in analyzing the problem within that system was to say light be. And when light came, God set an aim. I need to create an extension of my kingdom on this place. So everything that God did going from there was developing a plan for improving the system that he saw. The, the system of chaos that he saw. And the measures he put in place when he told man, that it should be productive, it should increase, it should fill the earth. So he had developed those measures. I'm going to be measuring you on your productivity, on your ability to fulfill kingdom mandates, right? Not necessarily to earn a salary or what have you, but to fulfill kingdom mandates. So those were the measures that the master himself set out for us. Now, what about testing changes? Of course, we know that man fell. That was a failed PDSA. And God instituted a plan to bring Christ to us so that he can bring us back to himself. And some of the changes that God tested, you would agree with me, were things like giving the law and sending the prophets, the major ones and minor ones, and bringing kings and all of those kind of things. But Again, he brought his son, which was the last, in my opinion, the last change idea that God brought. And when he tested that, it worked and we got reconnected with God. And God then said through Christ to his people, now you can spread the gospel. So we have succeeded in reuniting man to God. Now you can spread this, this model. And that's why we're kingdom. So even our work as healthcare professionals is basically to spread the kingdom, all right? That's the success, they spread the kingdom, spread the gospel. The gospel is the kingdom, all right? So let's move forward. There are three levels of agency, people you can engage with um, or units you can engage with as you spread um, improvement in our system. Self level, interpersonal level, team level, and system level. I'm certain that you will find yourself at any one of these. So you do not be, need to become the CMD of your organization or you need to become the CEO before you're able to activate people's agency, people's ability to make choices and begin to influence for the kingdom. Now, let me um, just share a couple of things with us around managing people or relating with people. And that's resistance because some of us are asking, so what if I bring my ideas and nobody buys into them or management doesn't even ag accept or the people that I lead are not following my instructions. So the pyramid of resistance basically tells us why people don't do the things they're meant to be doing. And we say that every in every system, you would have at least three of these um, sets of people. One, people who do not know what to do. Right. So if they don't know, building their capacity to do is not the way to go. You need to communicate effectively. You need to engage with them, co-produce, co-create. You need to model, show leadership. You need to have clarity. Do people have job descriptions? Is it clearly written? Do they understand it? Do they know why they have been told to do what you're asking them to do? The second level or category of people are people who know what they are meant to do, but they are not able. Because we assume that because they went through medical school or school of nursing or technology school, 
they automatically know. So these are the category of people that require capacity building or training because they know what to do. It's documented in their job descriptions, but they don't know how. They, they don't have their skill set or the knowledge. So we build capacity. We develop um, skill development or capacity build, building programs, and we give them role models or coaches or mentors. The third category of people are people who know what to do. They have had their capacity built, but they are not willing. So these are the category of people that you ask yourself, should they even be within this organization? Because there may be no cultural alignment, but you should still have a conversation with them to see how you can um, show them the alignment between the organizational vision and their own purpose for living. Okay. What are the 21st century realities and what are the challenges that we have as Christians working in health systems or systems generally? First of all, are the changing demands. Uh, things are evolving. The environment is rapidly evolving. It's complex, adaptive. Things are not the same. The, the complexity of needs are huge. Technology is really very fast. So we're having to learn new things, creating such levels of anxiety in many of us. Um, the patient-centered care or people-centered care is also a challenge for many people like we don't want to give over or give off control or even come to that space where we can have the necessary conversations with the people that we're taking care of quality assurance can be a, a, a pain in the neck if it is not properly used because people then see quality as a stick approach versus it's supposed to be a culture that helps us do the things that we're meant to be doing in a better way the costing and funding remuneration and things like that uh, i would say they are above my pay grade but the important information I need to pass across around the remuneration is, and I hope someone hears this and hears me good. God is the rewarder. God is the one who rewards us. We work for God. It says we should do everything as we see as unto God, as unto the Lord. And if we see our workplace, not as secular, but as a spiritual, as a platform of spiritual offering to God, trust me, it will come through. I don't know how it will meet you at the point of your need, but I know it will because it is a rewarder. All right. All right. So what are our opportunities? Our opportunities are these. We are not ordinary people. If I was speaking to a group or an audience of secular people, this would not be my slide deck. Trust me. But I speak with you from my heart because I know who we are based on the realities of the word of God. We are not ordinary people. We are not usual people. We are not normal people. We are kingdom. Because we think the thoughts of God, because we use the word of God and we speak the word of God. We believe what God says about everything, including the work of our hands. And therefore we do the works of God. He says greater works than these you will do. And his word says, because as he, Christ, is right now, so are we, not so we would be, so are we right now. We have his wisdom, we have his grace, we have his influence, we have his insight, we have depths of unknown resources that we can tap into. Not theoretically, we are basically and literally kingdom. Nelson Mandela says, there is no passion to be found playing small in settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. We are capable of living the very life of God, even in our work. Our work is not separate from the life of God within us. Let's breathe out. Let's express fully the sovereignty, the wisdom, the insights, and the grace of God in the work that we do. I want you to take a moment to reflect and think about how I know this has been a lot of information, a lot of new um, words and stuff like that. Um, I trust that we'll get the resources at the end of the submit, summit. But how would you apply the new knowledge to your work? I, I don't want us to just be motivated in this space and over this weekend. And on Monday, we'll go back to business as usual. No. Every single session has been strategically designed to transform our lives and let us be transformed as we do that. Thank you so much and God bless you. And if there are questions, I'm willing to, I know we run out of time, but I'm willing to take a few questions before we call it a day for this session. Thank you so very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Samuel. So we we'll want to take a question. Okay, let's take uh, Professor Mukuli. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Samuel. This is Professor Mukulu. I just want you to address briefly how an individual can indeed influence quality improvement, just as an individual influence quality improvement. Thank you. Th thank you so very much, Professor. I appreciate you. So very, very valid question you have asked because we are not all in positions of power as it is. But the understanding of quality improvement is that the individuals are even the ones who have the greater opportunity because one, we're closer to the place of work. We're closer to the front line. So we see the problems from a different perspective, but a closer perspective. So the first way that an individual can influence improvement is one, pay attention. Use the resources that God has given you, your interaction with patients every day to pay attention. And in paying attention, you can do one of many things. The first one is you have the ability to begin to collect data. Um, you can even use the, the routine data that you're collecting, but pay attention enough to be able to collect data. The question I will throw back to the audience is how many of us even look at the data that we submit to management to even see is there a trend? Is something going on here that we don't know about? So an individual has the ability to collect data and look at data that they have. I'm not asking you to generate an article and send to the public. Please follow your protocols, but interact with the patient. Um, ask five, 10 patients randomly. What are the things you think you can improve? So you can take action. The power lies with the individuals. That's one. The second one is we are all leaders at whatever level that we, are, we find ourselves. So we can influence conversations. We can find another person of like minds, another Christian, another Christian, another team member, and say, can we look at this complaint that the patients have been given and say, and design a quality improvement project? For an example, it doesn't require money. Trust me on that. It just requires you to use the same time that you have been using five minutes or 10 minutes every day consistently, and you'll be able to create a quality improvement um, project that you can then execute harvest data. That data would come very handy when you are making presentations to management. Remember, the leadership doesn't always have the view that we have as individuals at the front line. And so at times, in fact, most times when we need to engage with them, they need evidence. And the evidence will not jump on us. We need to be able to defend or make a business case for quality by collecting evidence. The last one I'm going to mention, build capacity, is go for knowledge. Professor Mokulu is a father, is a mentor, is a teacher, is a model. Go for knowledge, improve yourself. Don't say, oh, nobody has sent me for any training. There are many free resources online on quality improvement. Go for knowledge, for knowledge, learn about improvement tools, learn about little changes you can make to begin to, you know, generate that business case and then make improvement, um, a business case for improvement with management. I hope that answers your question, Professor. Thank you so thank much for asking it. Thank you very much, Dr. Samuel. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Sorry, ma, yes. I see um, ABT, AB, UTH, Zaria, mm -hmm. Eloran Chapter, Kano, Joss with their hands raised. Okay, okay, so let's take one more. Okay, please, so hold on. Uh, you asked about, if I heard you correctly, you asked about the relationship between quality improvements and audit. audit yes. Thank you very much. Great, great, great question, sir. So audit is, audit is quality assurance because what audit does is to measure your performance 
against established standards. Okay? Now, please, let's remember, it's like when we talk about quality management, like I told you, it's quality planning, quality assurance, and then quality improvement. When we talk about quality planning, it's like talking about the soup that our mothers and wives make. You can't say you want to separate tomato from the pepper and from the oil. It's it's one it's one old lot, yeah. So quality assurance is the protocol, the standards that you have established, and the audit is the process you go through to say have people been following the standards, okay? So that is quality assurance. The culture of quality improvement is to ask now that you you've discovered that people are not following, are not always following the standards. Quality improvement would now ask you, friendly, is it because they don't who comes into your clinic? But you end up finding now that your sphygmo manometer is not functional. Then it's going to be difficult for people to follow through. So audit is important, but not as an end in itself. The end is that people find out after they found out the gaps in following guidelines how do we improve the system how do we make the protocols and the guidelines user friendly how do we support the frontline worker to follow the standards and the guidelines we provided for them thank you thank you very much sir god bless you